Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming this evening. My name is Dr. Leslie Shannon. I'm an associate professor in the School of Engineering Science and the President Dream Colloquium Chair for this colloquium on women in technology, recruitment, retention, and promotion. I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded territory of the Selah Tooth, Squamish, and Musqueam First Nations. And I have the honor of introducing a newfound friend, very excited, Aoife McNamara, Dean of Simon Fraser University's Faculty of Communication, Art, Technology. Uh, sorry, I'm reading this because we're in the middle of moving office and I couldn't find a printer. So bear, bear with me, I made some notes. Um, so it really is my pleasure to introduce you, to welcome everyone to the first lecture and in what is now the 11th iteration of the President's Dream Colloquium. So I was surprised when I saw actually how many had happened. Um, women in technology, attracting, retaining and promoting diverse talent is a subject very close to my own heart. And I think, don't think there will be anybody working in this university or studying in this university or indeed partnering with us in many of our ventures for whom this isn't a pretty critical issue. Um, so it's a, a great um, advantage to us to be able to, to, to have this discussion in this kind of forum. And I'll get to you later. Juliet. <laughs> um, so, but um, I'd also like to begin to acknowledge this evening by begin this evening by acknowledging that we're gathering this evening on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, and as mentioned earlier, on the shared territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. So that's. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Dream Colloquium in case anyone doesn't know about it, because it's actually a significant tool for us in opening up conversations like this. So I'm just going to give, talk a little bit about that and then just go on to introduce Juliet. So the colloquium was launched in 2011 by President Petter and since then it's, be, it's started to play actually a pretty significant role in delivering SFU's mission as an engaged or as Canada's leading engaged research university and and I think it's the combination of engaged with research that's really important and for which um, the dream colloquium is a significant um, tool so since since it was started um, the colloquium has empowered faculty to bring leading thinkers makers and doers to SFU to engage students communities and faculty in intensive interdisciplinary exchange on timely and often pressing themes. And obviously what's timely and pressing for me may not be for you, but there's a consensus around, and it's an interesting process because themes are solicited from faculty, so they come that way. So the colloquia run for a semester and they're organized around themes, supported, proposed by the faculty and then supported by the president's office. And in the very short six years since it's been here, longer than me, four years longer than me, in fact, um, we've already had really quite significant discussions, conversations and dialogue around a range of themes and they, um, just in case you didn't know any of all of them, Juliet, I'll bring them up because many of them actually feed into the work that you're doing. So things that range from the complexity of life, justice beyond national borders, entrepreneurship in all its many um, forms, obedience and disobedience, taking action on climate change, protecting indigenous cultural heritage, emergent policy and practice, traveling for health, returning to the teachings, justice, identity and belonging in the 21st century, engaging big data and understanding medical marijuana. So this evening I wanted to um, especially thank um, Dr. Leslie Shannon and um, we've never met until this evening but as I told her I'm a groupie and a, a stalker of her work. Um, she is SFU's National Science and Engineering NSERC um, Council's Chair in Women in Science and Engineering and that is an incredibly important role in this institution and beyond and she certainly um, made an impact and will I know make an even greater impact as it goes on. One of the things I valued um, of her work, about her work and indeed about this colloquium is the way that she calls attention to and invites dialogue around the persistent, frustratingly persistent and gendered poverty of expectation around the culture of talent development in science and technology. And talent development within the university but also in the workplace. So you, you get over one hurdle and you just get ready to bounce over a whole lot of other ones. Um, and actually making us look at those things and take them seriously is, is the first and important step to understanding how to overcome them. So in her work, Dr. Shannon reminds us that without diversity, the pace of innovation in the development of new knowledge and understanding in science and technology will always fall short of our expectations. It'll continue to, leave, to limp. 
Proper, impactful strides can and will only be taken when we learn how to harness the full spectrum of human intellectual and creative capacity. Male, female, black, brown, indigenous, whoever we are, we can't actually afford to neglect capacity because it doesn't look like us. Um, engineers and programmers are important. And I'm, I come from fine art. I'm actually a, an experimental opera writer. <laughs> but even within my field, it's, it's impossible to ignore the impact, power, and potential of engineers and programmers, computer sciences of all kinds for all of our work. You know, there was that interesting data something on the outside. What was that? Data is the poster? I can't remember what it said, but it was interesting. We are in the world of data, basically. So too often, science, um, too often research in science and technology continues to be focused on solving the problems encountered by men just like the ones doing the research. So unless you bring, unless you stage encounters between humanity in its broadest sense and the possibilities, pleasures, and promises of science and technology, unless you bring those things together, you're not even going to know what the problems are. And so this is one of the great challenges that we face. So to achieve these advances, these advances and to solve problems that impact humankind more broadly, we need more people to step up to these challenges. And, uh, Perfect example, if people like our esteemed speaker, Juliette Power, who I'm really privileged to introduce and delighted to meet. Um, Powell's inspiring achievements as a media entrepreneur, a consultant, a community catalyst, and many, many other things are testament to what is possible when technology, science, engineering, and all of our work open up to and take advantage of talent motivated by talent that doesn't look like us necessarily and talent motivated by community building and enriched by deep knowledge of people, technologies, and businesses that are at the forefront of a connected society but might not have been at the heart of society as it was at another time. Um, so without any, any other fuss, I'd really like to welcome Juliette Power. Introduction there. Just wanted to also put this in context of some of the other things that are going on here. We were really pleased to have uh, Juliette up on campus earlier today, uh, talking at the as part of our Big Data Initiative uh, uh, Visionary Series. And in terms of that, this is part of the reason that Key uh, SFU's Big Data Initiative is a sponsor of this event for tonight. I'm Fred Popwich. I'm the executive director of Key, and I just wanted to briefly set the context for the whole initiative of working with the President's Dream Colloquium and our Big Data Initiative here at SFU. Because at SFU, we are really committed to exploring how data can help us move past traditional barriers we've had in research, innovation, and to look at engagement in new ways. We're committed to exploring what data can do, what it should do, and, what, and balance the risks with the possibilities. Uh, tonight, you know, Key has the distinct pleasure of not only being a sponsor of the President's Dream Colloquium on Women in Technology series, but also the pleasure of being tonight's uh, presenting sponsor for the, uh, for the talk. And uh, we've heard from Aoife of the uh, different aspects of uh, Juliet's experiences in the, both in, um, in terms of media, in terms of community, and uh, really she's drawing on a decade of experience in integrated media involving television, mobile, social media, and, and, and what I've seen her talk about earlier today and what I expect her to talk about tonight, she identifies the patterns and practices of successful business leaders who bank on social technology, communications, and data in order to win. So please welcome me and Aoife and giving a warm welcome to Julia Powell. Well, hello. I'm really, really pleased to be here. I love Vancouver and I am thrilled to be here again. I am beholden to the university actually for, and Fred in particular, for inviting me. The truth is that I get to cut class and be here with you because I am a new student at Columbia University where I'm studying computer science even though I've been working in the field um, for a very, very long time. In fact, I started coding when I was a kid because my mom uh, couldn't afford a babysitter. And so she was taking courses at McGill University in Montreal 
and she would take me to class with her. And so we would sit together when I was seven, eight, nine years old, and we'd do our homework together. And that's really what got me interested in technology, and it just so happened that the internet was on its way up, and my math teacher a few years later, um, a wonderful, wonderful man with whom I never really had a conversation because I was so shy and so introverted that I would sit at the back of the class, keep my head down, and do all of my homework. Um, and one day he came up to me, and I was very startled, very, very uncomfortable. And he said, well, I think that it's about time that you opened up. And clearly, you are not the most social being in the world. And as a result, I have accepted on your behalf a summer assistantship at Concordia University. I was still like in high school, like just beginning to go to high school. Um, but I had pretty good math grades, and I didn't even realize it. That's how little I actually spoke to other kids. I had no idea that I was good at math. I had no idea that I was good at science. So he pointed this out to me, and next thing I knew, I was in the sub-basement at Concordia University, and I was helping to build amphibious cars that we were racing all over the world, and I was building the databases um, to kind of keep track of our progress and keep track of how well the, the vehicles were holding up and the different components, and that was my first introduction, not just to mechanical engineering, but to myself and my ability to connect with other people and to find my own voice and I realized that it was okay if I was an introvert, it was okay if I wasn't so comfortable around other people because when I talked about things that I'm really passionate about, I can talk to anybody because it comes from the heart. And so my path is, is a little unconventional, um, but I connected with computers truly before I ever really connected with people. And, Part of the reason why I never really connected with people is because I was always told to be quiet. Shh, Juliet, stop talking, stop asking questions, stop it, stop it, stop it. So I stopped asking questions and I started using the internet to try to find my own answers. And I am thrilled that my mother, on the other hand, always supported my steps towards trying to figure out who I was, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, and so in a long kind of roundabout way, I ended up um, seeing somebody being interviewed on television. And at the time I lived in Montreal, and my first language is French, donc il faisait l'entrevue en français. But the person that was doing the interview was not so great at doing live translations. And he did such a horrible job. And I'm sitting there in front of the television, like, oh my god, that is not what that person said that it convinced me that I too could be on television because I knew I could do a better job than that. And so I went through the back door, ended up convincing Moses Neimer um, that I was going to be his next great interviewer and I got lucky because that morning their star interviewer had just quit and lo and behold I had a job on television. Now I didn't know anything more about television than I knew really about socializing or anything else but boy did I learn how to fake it and with that I, um, I was lucky enough to meet this gentleman, a gentleman who is no longer with us, but who remains in my heart and the hearts of billions of people around the world, Nelson Mandela, who really inspired me because he made me realize that even though at the time I was doing entertainment, um, I was specifically interviewing celebrities, and I felt like I had this higher calling, but I really didn't know how to achieve it, especially, again, geek at heart, but, you know, to the rest of the world, I was this pretty fluffy thing that, you know, bounced around in front of the camera. And he was kind enough to take a few seconds and remind me that just by my very presence, being one of the first people of color, female people of color on television, that I was already making a difference. The fact that I was overcoming my fear and facing my fear and trying to do something positive with it was already making a difference. And so I really, really took that to heart and I decided to investigate more about how I too could truly make a difference that I could feel. And I realized that one thing that I felt very comfortable in was technology, very comfortable in connecting with people that actually had something to say, had meaning and purpose and drive, very much like many of the people that I met here today. And so I started asking more questions, but this time I was encouraged. So. I was very, very fortunate to be asked by Intel Labs to help them with some of their research um, a few years later. And 
it was quite interesting because they had spent millions and millions of dollars of trying to map the personal data economy. Uh, and their way of pursuing it was by trying to develop technology tools, if you will, uh, where they could <laughs> do queries with data scientists all over the world who would never connect face to face. Let's do it all on machines. And their idea was they wanted to be able to scale this and as a result create a collaborative tool. Well, none of the data scientists, regardless of where they came from or what they worked in, really liked their tool. They just weren't into it. So I decided that I was going to use one of the tools that I was very familiar with, which is let's create a fun environment and invite everybody to the party. If we invite all the cool kids, the rest of the kids are going to want to come. And at that point, the coolest thing that I had ever experienced was something called TED, the TED conference. There are many TED videos online. It's based on a real event that happens right here in Vancouver. And for anybody who is interested in actually participating, I mentioned this to somebody earlier today, there's a wonderful program called the TED Fellows Program. Um, go to TED.com, look at the fellowship. Anybody can enroll. It's about ideas. It's about acting on those ideas. And it's about creating an environment in which you actually can do these kinds of things. It doesn't take you away from university. It doesn't take you away from your job. But it adds to your life and it adds to your thinking. So in terms of the project that I ended up doing with Intel Labs, I said, ha, let's go to TED. And sure enough, we set up three cameras at the back of a room. And I invited a couple of people, like Bill Joy, who is one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, and um, John Perry Barlow, who is uh, the founder or one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And they showed up. And not only did they show up, but they invited some of their friends. Why? Because it was no longer about creating a tool for Intel to be able to monetize. Now all of a sudden we had created a paradigm where it was we, the community, are going to map out the personal data ecosystem on a global level. And we've got some of the best thinkers in the world in this very room, so let's give it our all. And of course there's also this thing about the camera which some of you might be familiar with. You can ask somebody a question and they might not really know how to answer and so they'll avoid and sidestep or walk away but you put a camera on them all of a sudden they're on and they must respond and if they have the chance because they've got a few peers in the room then they challenge their peers to come and give a better answer to complete their answer and so we started kind of this informal competition with the data scientists in the room and the entrepreneurs to get a better sense of you know, how, if you lived in Africa, would you feel about personal data? Or if you were working for a nonprofit as opposed to a for-profit. So we got many different angles, many different takes on the same subjects. And with that, we ended up interviewing 100 data scientists in two and a half days, one after the other. After a while, we started doing two and three at a time because, again, they got so excited about the prospect of being able to share this knowledge that we could barely shut them up at one point, which is great because, again, I'm all about asking questions as opposed to necessarily finding the answer. So here's a snapshot of some of the wonderful people that participated in the project that initially was called the Vibrant Data Project. It just didn't feel very sticky. Nobody really wanted to do anything with the Vibrant Data Project which was Intel Labs' initial name for it. And so we started looking around, and I tried to explain to people that weren't involved what we were doing. And I said, it's like, you know, we, we, we the data. We are generating data. We the data, that's the name of the project. Great, done. It became sticky. Um, and we ended up getting some wonderful coverage at the World Economic Forum, as well as in the New York Times and uh, MIT Technology Review. And this became kind of my own personal symbol of what I was going to do. That it wasn't necessarily about getting world leaders or world thinkers, it was about each and every one of us participating in this personal data economy, whether we're conscious of it or not. Of course, every time we pull out a device, every time we swipe our credit cards, every time we enter a room, Yes, that is our personal data that is being shared, again, whether we are conscious of it or not. It is being monetized, whether we are conscious of it or not. So one of the things that came out of the research that we did with Intel Labs is that there are just four grand challenges that we have to overcome if we truly want to have a personal data economy that is not just good for the powers that be, the usual suspects, but that is good for the betterment of humanity. That is each and every person on the planet now and to come, whether they are conscious of it or not. Um, 
One of the things that I wanted to talk about today is the digital infrastructure. So there's been a lot of talk about digital infrastructure, especially in the US right now um, with the new presidency. Also with the hurricanes, what are we going to do? How are we going to spend this money? What makes the most sense? How can we be the most efficient? How can we actually help people? And it's something that's been on all of our minds, I think. Uh, at the same time, another issue is very much front and foremost, especially if you live in the United States, or if you live online for that matter, which is this idea of digital trust. Who can you trust? And for a very, very long time, people online really felt like the only people that they could trust were people that responded quickly. The, qui the quicker you responded on social media, the more people tended to trust you. There have been all kinds of research on this. The, who responds the quickest online? It's the bots, right? Think about that. It's the algorithms. It's the chat boxes. It's, it's the fake news, unfortunately, at this particular moment in time. And so that whole issue of digital trust remains at the same time as the digital infrastructure issue. And of course, there are naysayers around artificial intelligence that just capture the imagination of the world because they're really, really well known for their entrepreneurial feats. And of course, if they're investing in artificial intelligence and they say that it's dangerous, then it must be dangerous, it must be terrifying. And then you've got the other guys, like the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, uh, who represent you know, the counterparts, those that actually have the monopolies, such as Facebook or Google, that are saying, no, 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 you know. <laughs> that's not true, and Elon's coming back and saying, oh yes, that's true, I know what I'm talking about, he doesn't know what he's talking about. At the end of the day, the most important thing is, what do you think? And I'm asking you this from the perspective of a human being, not based on what your title is, what your job is, what you're passionate about. What the heck do we want to do with our society moving forward? What do we want to do with our personal data? What kind of world do we want to build for the future generations? And so that brings us to a concept that's being explored right now in Europe as well as in China, uh, which is something that um, an economist came up with, Jeremy Rifkin, called the Third Industrial Revolution. There's a book by that name. And essentially what he's talking about is the fact that not only are we all human sensors, in other words, all of our personal data within us is being shared every time we go to the doctor, every time that we go to the bathroom, if you will, depending on where you go to the bathroom. But more importantly, the infrastructure that he's talking about is currently being built, which means that billions of investment dollars in China and in Europe are going towards this third industrial revolution. And what he means by that is that the first and second industrial revolution were built on three core technologies being invented roughly within the same time span. So 30 to 100 years, right? So, and those three core technologies are new energy, new mobility, and new communication. Now, we have all of those things. We have all of those things right here, right now. The question is, what are we going to do with it? So, again, every time you swipe, every time you use new energy, every time you drive your car, this is an image of the city of tomorrow that Ford is working on. There are many, 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 many different companies around the world, these multinational companies that are trying to envision what we will look like in the future, what kind of cities, what kind of lives will we have. But for the most part, what I'm hearing is that the stakeholders that are involved are not necessarily human beings. They're talking about stakeholders as government. They're talking about stakeholders as institutions. They're talking about partners. They're talking about politicians. I keep asking them, well, where are the people in this equation? Where do we get to have our say on how we're going to run our cities and how we're going to run our lives? And so this is why when I get a wonderful invitations like this that I try to show up, because I think it's really, really important Every single device that you have in your home, if it was bought in the last couple of years, probably is embedded with smart chips, right? And smart chips are great. They're connected to the internet, IoT. Um, I think just about everybody in this room has heard of this. You know what it does. You know how it works. Am I, is that right? You all know what IoT is, the Internet of Things? Not necessarily. OK. Um, so. How do I even begin with the Internet of Things? Let's see now. Uh, so all of your smart devices, whether it's your phones, your computers, um, 
every single time that you buy a nest, those thermometers that, um, that tell you what the temperature is in your home, you don't even have to touch it. It essentially learns what you like, learns what you need, and sets it based on what you prefer. The same thing when you're using Amazon, for example, right? Every single time that you use it, it learns more about you. It learns more about what you like, what you prefer. Whether it's Netflix or a device, it's essentially the same thing. When we buy these new electronic devices, they have these chips in them that are not just communicating with us, that are not just learning about us, but they are sharing and transmitting right, that information to the manufacturer. One thing that very few people think about is a conversation that I had recently, uh, which is the portfolio owners of all of these smart chips. They have double deals. They have a deal with the people that are buying the chips, the Intels, the NVIDIAs of the world, uh, the Toshibas of the world, you name it, Apple, everybody are buying these chips and they think that, oh, well, I can control where my data goes because I know Apple and I know Toshiba and I know NVIDIA and everybody else. What most of us don't realize is those that own the portfolios of intellectual property on these chips are making two kinds of deals. One, an exclusive deal where you, the manufacturer who are buying my chips, you can use them as you wish, you keep the data. The second kind of deal that they're making is, oh, well, we'll give you a rebate on the cost of these chips, which, by the way, cost almost nothing, which is why we've got billions of chips everywhere. <coughs> but because we're giving you a discount on the cost of these chips, we have access to all of the data that flows through these chips. So there are certain people, certain organizations that have access to most of the data in the world, and most of us will never, ever hear about this. Now, the question is, what are they doing with that data? That is to be seen. But the next time you hear about an intelligent home or an intelligent device, you hear about a fridge that tells you when you're, you're not going to have enough milk or that advises you that you know perhaps it's a little too cool in your home for your liking, but your husband likes it, or even your bed right, that adjusts the temperature based on what you prefer. All of this information is going towards you, but it's also going to second and third and fourth parties that you will never hear about. New York City. Um, is where I live right now and it's where I'm going to school and luckily I get to study all of this stuff. I also get to work in it as a, as a sideline, if you will, because I care about it. But one of the things that really made me care about participating in this process as opposed to just being a bystander is the fact that New York City started an initiative called CUSP. And so it's got NYU and five other universities all over the world. They embedded billions and billions and billions of chips uh, throughout the buildings, throughout all of the meters that read um, everything from the exhaust of cars to the temperature of homes, uh, the, you know, all of those uh, cable companies, all of the gas companies, everyone is participating in this. And all of this information is then relayed back to the universities who are going through the data to try to figure out the most efficient way of using it for the betterment of all of the citizens in the city. Now. Again, that just leaves the people that live in New York City as bystanders, but they went an extra step where they've now empowered citizens to become citizen scientists, where you, thanks to your smart device, can now start, if you choose, uploading data that is necessary for true predictive analysis so that you get to participate. You get to decide what you want to share, what you don't want to share. Do you care about mass transportation? Do you care about energy? Do you care about you know, some of the homeless people that are on the, the corner of your stoop. If you do, then there's more incentive to participate. And what's way more interesting to me is that it's a great way to learn how to be a data scientist, right? It's fantastic to go out and get a degree and bravo to everybody who's doing it. But most importantly, beyond the institutions, I think it's up to all of us to figure out what we care about and where there's an opportunity to actually participate and start shaping this stuff. So <laughs> New York City and its citizens are doing just that. Now there are millions of people, there are about 38 blocks uh, of housing in Brooklyn where people are actively doing this stuff and it's just the beginning, they're only in their second year. So I'm very excited about seeing where that's gonna go. And of course, for anybody who's been in the hospital recently, you might have seen a change. Um, especially, I've been to the Mayo. Oh, sorry. I've been to the.
I've been to the Mayo Clinic recently and I realize that there's a lot more uh, personalized treatments based on personalized data. So more and more people are uploading their data based on, you know, wanting to help other people, not just because they hope to find a cure for their particular disease, but because they hope to be able to contribute to other people's lives so that they don't have to suffer as much as they've suffered themselves. And so we see a lot of altruism, a lot of sharing of data that just wasn't happening before. And that's completely changing just about every industry in the world. And it's shaping our lives as well as lives that are just beginning to be born or have yet to be born. And that's really inspiring when you start to think about uh, a number that I saw on CNET not too long ago where 92% of newborns in the United States already have an online profile by the time they're born, right? So you've already got a digital trail before you even hit the ground. So you have no control as an individual unless you decide to take control and start learning what all of this stuff means and how it impacts you. So we do a lot of research. I started a, a think tank a, a while ago because I was curious about all this and I wanted to get more perspectives on this and then eventually companies and governments kind of jump on board, oh, you're doing some cool stuff, can we participate? Sure. Um, so we, we always start the process like this. We think about the individual, the person. What does the person think? How do we feel as humans? And then we go on to the level of the organization and what the organization cares about and how do we find the intersection between those two interests. At the end of the day, it comes back to what I was saying before, right? It's about asking better questions. And if you're an organization, your nature is to ask questions that benefit the organization if you're an institution the same way, unless you're a very special institution like this one. But what I've noticed is that we're seeing more and more interdisciplinary work, but one thing remains. Where are the women? Where are the women? Why is it that when I'm hosting, <laughs> literally, a conference in San Francisco on artificial intelligence, and I am the only woman in the room who is not, you know, essentially carrying coffee for her boss, that scares me. When I look out into a room and I realize that I'm the only African American person or person of mixed anything in the room, that makes me very, very nervous. And it's one thing to go to business conferences where you really generally have a wonderful cross-section of people. But when you go to these highly um, focused tech conferences and you are the only one in every single one, that makes me nervous. And that's why I decided to go back to school. I'll show you a little bit more about why that's important to me. It's funny, I've never really thought of myself or as a woman or as a black woman or any of that stuff. I always thought of myself as a human being, really, until I kept getting hit on the head with the fact that artificial intelligence has a white man issue. And I say this with humor and good naturedness and at the same time it is very true just based on the data. Um, go to any, any center of research for artificial intelligence in the United States and you'll see exactly what I mean. Perhaps here in Canada it's a little different. But one of the things that really made me smile this morning as I was looking through the news and I was seeing that VentureBeat had covered these two ladies. Um, I think that we need more of this. We need more investment from women, not just women learning STEM, not just women participating in the overall process, but women coming at it from every single level because we tend to have questions that are very, very different fundamentally from men. Um, we also, as women, have a capacity for empathy and communication um, that I, I would like to think comes from my mom. Maybe I'm wrong, but perhaps it's just my own perception because she just passed away. And so I wanted to dedicate this talk to her because she really is the one who inspired me to find my voice and to become digitally literate. And I'm hoping that these two ladies and the millions of other women that are to come uh, that will invest in artificial intelligence will also help inspire others to do the same. One of the things that I realized in working with large corporations and institutions is that many of them are still very much at this phase, right? Where they're looking at the data within an organization and they're seeing, oh my gosh, we've got so much data, we don't know what to do with it. And they go out and try to hire people like me to try to figure it out. 
What I tell them is, you're just at the beginning. Let's, you know, I'll hold your hand. We'll walk you through it. Let's make sure that we respect people, that we don't just sell their data because we can, because we want to monetize, because we want to make more money for the quarter. Because this next phase is something that I'm seeing more and more, where you've got more and more industries that are aggregating their data, including your data, um, to try to better target you, to try to better become efficient um, as a group. The next phase is what I was talking about before, the third industrial revolution, where all of a sudden we are sharing data across industries around the world, right? And if this third industrial revolution starts happening in the Americas, then the goal of the economist that first came up with the concept, Jeremy Rifkin, is to connect all of these smart infrastructures around the world so that essentially everything becomes intelligent. Intelligent schools, intelligent bots that are teaching us different things. And that seems like a fairly exciting world because there's a whole lot of data out there and we can do a lot of good with it. But it's interesting how people like Elon Musk are afraid of this and yet we don't seem to be afraid of this which is this vision of tomorrow, this interconnected infrastructure that we'd all be living in. Frankly, all of this kind of makes me nervous because I'm still the one generally who's alone in the room who's saying, but, but wait a minute, wait a minute, that all sounds really, really great. Except have you looked at the latest research on computer vision, for example, where they've done countless research, and there's a wonderful, wonderful TED talk, uh, and I'm blanking on her name, but this, this young researcher from MIT, she's African American, and she presented an amazing TED talk where she talks about how she was trying to train her artificial intelligence, and it wasn't working. It wasn't recognizing her. And she couldn't figure out why it wasn't recognizing her. And then she put a white mask on. And oh, the computer recognized her. And she realized that it's because most of the training data that goes into training <laughs> these things is based on white males. Hence the AI having the white male issue. It's not that there's anything wrong with white males. It's that we tend to think of ourselves first. And so if you're a white male and you've got a bunch of white males around you, of course, you're going to pull data from them and start training your, your thing, right? So we need more people. We need more diversity. We need more women. We need more colors. Well, consciousness is beginning. Actually, doing something about it is something else. And there are multiple steps, right? And we're all at different levels. And so one of the reasons why that really got me nervous is because I'm also dealing with companies like Ford that are dealing with autonomous cars. Just about every car company in the world is dealing with autonomous cars. In fact, many are projecting having them on the road by 2018 which is right around the corner. Did, did people ever, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm, 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 it's okay. But did people ever actually also, you know, um, provide the evidence of who they believe has... Um, they don't have to. They don't have but, to. But, but if, if yeah. that was, if, if it began to be important and necessary, that yes. would change what we do. I completely agree with you. In fact, I've worked with the IEEE. We're working... Um, on standards around artificial intelligence on a global level. Uh, what's really remarkable about that is that, sure, we can come up with all the standards in the world, but if companies and organizations decide that they don't want to use them, they don't have to. And so I started talking about, you know, what would make a company want to use them. And I'm not going to name any corporate names because I know that you're sponsored, but what I will say is that many of the companies that were kind enough to respond to me off the record, to your point, are willing to do so. They're willing to implement these standards because they don't want to get sued. And if they do get sued, they want to be able to point to the standard and say, wait a minute, we follow the standard. Right? So it all comes down to money. And for me, it all comes down to people. And at some point, you have to decide what's more important to you. or in the best of all worlds, do it together. Now again, the reason why I'm showing you this particular slide um, and that I was harping on the fact that um, you know, computer vision is not where it should be if we're going to have any kind of autonomous car on the road at this point is because of the research that the young lady who wore the white mask discovered. And there are many, many, many different examples. All you have to do is Google it, is that computer vision right now recognizes white men. And it does not, for the most part, recognize women, or it does not recognize people of color, right? 
And so this becomes an issue, and it really hit me last night. I flew in last night. It was, I was tired. It was probably, I don't know, midnight, something like that. And so I get to Vancouver Airport, and I'm happy. Yay, I'm going to go hit the, hit the hotel and you know, give a talk tomorrow, and I'm very, very excited. And so, of course, when you fly into Vancouver, you all probably know this, you look at, you, you have to look at the, um, the scanner, right? You put your passport in, and the scanner is trying to take your picture. So I'm standing there, and I'm tired, and the thing, it's flashing in my face, and it, no, it has to take another picture. It's flashing in my face, no, it has to. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. This computer vision does not recognize me. And I was so pissed off. And I got to the front, and I'm giving my passport to the agent there, and I'm asking him about the technology. And he, I don't know. That's not what I do. Look on our website. And I look on the website. There's nothing about this on the website. I'm like, who are you supposed to talk to about this stuff? Right? So I've got five more minutes to try to drive this home back to the IEEE. So the, the reason why I'm so glad that you brought this up very much ties into this. If you get a chance, you want to test out your own ethics. What you would do if you had, for instance, if you were an autonomous car, right? And you have the choice between hitting another vehicle or hitting a dog or hitting a monkey. What are you going to choose? Well, a lot of people would say the monkey because they love their dogs and they love other humans. But what happens when you find out that the monkey is me? Think about that for a minute. In fact, don't think about that. Go test it out. Go see how you would react. And, and this is you know, one of many, many, many different exercises that you can do for yourself to see if you were a computer, how would you respond? Because this is what we are asking of our artificial intelligence. And if we do not put more humanity into the task of developing it, then we're in trouble. We're very much in trouble. I mean, at this point, artificial intelligence can pinpoint or predict where there will be more crime. In fact, there's a whole Google app right now that tells you exactly where you should live and where you should not live based on who's been incarcerated, where the violence is, right? I'm not even going to go into this because we don't have enough time. There's a lot in the underbelly of AI that I could be talking about. Um, what I will say to you is that the only thing that I can personally do is go to school, figure out how to look under the hood of the algorithms, and figure out how to make better algorithms that represent all of us, not just some of us. The best that you can do is think about what we talked about today with all of your devices. See what kind of world that you would really want to live in and at the very least, talk to your friends. What you could also do if you wanted to is join us at IEEE. I would love to see you on the algorithmic bias committee, which I'm on, so that we have more perspectives. I think I'm the only Canadian. I'm definitely the only black woman. It would be great to get perspectives from all kinds of different people, because right now we've got a bunch of triple PhDs in me, which is really, really frightening when I think about that. So, as a friend of mine pointed out to me, you know, all of this digital world, this interconnected world, is really an organism in the process of being born, and we are all part of that organism, whether we realize it or not. We are feeding it every time we type, every time we tweet, every time we swipe a credit card. So at least let's be conscious of it. And if you want to know more, if you want to talk more about it, please reach out to me, and thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to quickly thank our speaker. Uh, just here we go. So I think we all really enjoyed this talk. You have to come back because you have to take the stick. It's talking sticks. You, talking stick. I should have given it to you earlier. Oh. It is actually really lovely. It was created by Jim Yelton of the Coast Sal Salish. My dear. Coast oh, wow. Salish Nation, and it's got the image of the eagle, was a symbol of great strength and leadership, and I think that fits. Thank you. And I really I think everybody really enjoyed this talk, so let's thank our speaker again. Oh. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, second thank you. <laughs> um, We're not going to take any questions, but you'll have the chance to talk to her afterwards directly, just because we started a little late. Um, 
I can't let you go to talk to her yet because we got a little bit late in our start and I didn't get a chance to thank our sponsors and that's always important. So I would really like to take a chance to thank the colloquium sponsors which include obviously the President's Office, the Department of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies, the Vice President and Research, the Simon Fraser University Vice President of Research, SFU's key big data initiative, thank you Fred for getting us into that, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, NSERC, Tableau, and um, the Simon Fraser University Faculty of Applied Sciences, as well as the School of Computing Science. And then I'm going to do a quick lead in here because the other sponsor is the West Coast Women in Engineering Science and Technology program, which you may not have heard of, but since that I'm the chair, you're going to hear about it now. <laughs> I won't take too long, but in addition to being an associate professor and chair of the colloquium, I do have this chair from NSERC for the BC UConn region, and because NSERC Chair for Women in Science and Engineering for BC UConn is the worst acronym ever, we go with WEST, West Coast Women in Engineering Science and Technology. Much easier to remember. Our mission is to engage industry, the community, and students to increase awareness and participation of women and other underrepresented groups in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM fields of study and careers. And we were really inspired to do this colloquium because uh, computing is rather poorly underrepresented, and I, as a computer engineer, am really poorly represented. I totally related to that comment of being the only woman in the room. I've been to conferences where every panel has men on it and there are no women. And I actually had the opportunity to say to someone, could we please put a woman on one of the panels? And they're like, but that last female speaker, she wasn't very good. And I'm sitting here going, do you think all women speak like her or do you think she's the only woman out there in this field? Those are the two options you're giving me. So we need to change that messaging because it is about creating better products, a better solution to societal problems. Our group intelligence goes up when not everybody thinks the same. And if you're having a hard time hiring because there aren't enough people in your talent pool, well, if you have rejected women and underrepresented minorities from that talent pool, you aren't looking at the majority of the people in your population because women make up about half of the population, throw in the rest of the underrepresented minorities, and you are well over the majority. So if you aren't doing that, you are fundamentally missing most of the people you could be hiring. I would just like to close with saying that any of my students, because this is a course, uh, you've gotten a really good lead in to the introduction lecture that we're gonna have tomorrow because Juliet, hit on so many of great points. Um, it's going, I'm really excited about this class. We're hitting on a lot of key topics. I really hope a lot of you will come out to some of the other topics. If you are particularly interested in big data, Kathy O'Neill, author of Weapons of Math Destruction, will be talking on October 26th, and you should get her into your standards because she's all about this whole thing that AI can be, unfortunately, a white man's thing used uh, maliciously and unfortunately doesn't help the minority. I expect it'll be a really good talk. The book was really fantastic. We've got a whole, uh, we've got seven speakers, so please go to our website, look them up. And if you have any more questions about the colloquium uh, or the class, feel free to come to talk to me or Danielle. She's the manager for my program. She does this 100% of the time and makes this reality work. So one more thanks to her, a thanks to Fred, and a thanks to Juliet. This is really great.